Hello, students. Today we will start a new topic concerning the force vibrations of a single degree of freedom system, of course. And we are going to take a generalized system in the sense that there is going to be some amount of damping, some amount of uh, spring stiffness, and, and mass also is going to be present, along with some external excitation, which is going to be harmonic in nature. These type of uh, systems happen to be the most common one. And uh, as far as the external excitation is present, it is going to appear uh, when a rotating mass, uh, such as has been depicted over here, with respect to a, a bearing system drawn on the left. So I have a disk at the center, which is rotating at an angular frequency of omega. And uh, O happens to be the axis of rotation. And uh, the entire mass of the disk can be assumed to be located at a distance uh, indicated over here at a distance of uh, R. And uh, the disk, of course, is rotating at an angular frequency of omega radians per second. Under these conditions, the Centrifugal force acting outward is given by m omega square r. So at any point, the force is going to be acting in a vertical upward direction. But since the disk itself is rotating, it means that the direction of the force is going to change as the disk rotate. But the amplitude of the force is going to be given by the same quantity that is m omega square r. And depending upon whether we are uh, interested in uh, vertical vibrations or whether the body is moving in a horizontal axis, horizontal direction, we tend to multiply this particular amplitude of the force by either a cos component or a sine component, which basically depends upon the initial uh, direction of uh, time uh, with reference to where we are measuring time. Anyhow, the system is going to be approximated as a simple mass attached to a spring and a damper. And uh, the coordinate system is also being prescribed. In the present case, it is in a direction uh, perpendicular, uh, uh, perpendicular uh, directed uh, downwards. That is the positive direction of motion. And there happens to be a external excitation also given. Uh, the excitation is given by a small f is equal to capital F, which happens to be the amplitude of uh, the external force multiplied by sine omega t. Sine omega, uh, omega of course, is the frequency of the harmonic force F. Okay, this is the uh, frequency. Angular frequency, that is. Uh, as far as the free body diagram is concerned, we always isolate the body, entire body, uh, from the force acting with, uh, in the surroundings. So when the mass M moves in a downward direction by amount X, some amount of spring force is going to come into picture given by Kx. Similarly, the viscous forces are going to be Kc uh, into x dot. Both these forces are going to act in the upper direction. And the harmonic force would be acting downwards because this is where, this is how we have assumed it to act. And uh, coming to the last force, which happens to be inertia, since the mass is moving downward, it can be assumed to be in a state of dynamic equilibrium by uh, by supposing that there is an imaginative force acting on the mass, acting uh, in the direction opposite to the direction of motion. And this, of course, is the inertia force. So once all these forces are clubbed together, we get the required differential equation of motion, which obviously is a non-homogeneous case because we actually have a term which is not equal to zero on the right hand side. Apart from this, it is a transient equation also because the displacement happens to be a function of time and uh, it is a second order. 
because the displacement has been divided, differentiated twice. Now this happens to be a simple differential equation. And of course, a number of ways have been taught in your elementary mathematical classes, classes of mathematics that is, to solve these type of uh, differential equations. But uh, anyway, we already know that this solution is going to compose of two parts. Let me just bring the other slide on display. Solution is going to be composed of two parts. The first part is going to be obtained when we keep a term zero in the right hand side. That is the complementary solution. And please observe that when the right hand side is zero, there actually is no external acceleration present, for which the equation basically reduces to a free vibration. It is a damped free vibration case. This the solution which is going to be obtained under these under this circumstances has already been derived in the previous chapter. It can belong to any of the three categories. That is, we can have a case of overdamped system where the response basically is going to be non-oscillatory type, but it is going to decay exponentially. It can be critically damped. In this case also, the response is a non-oscillatory type and the response is going to decay exponentially. But if the damping present happens to be less than the critical damping, then under this case, the response is going to be uh, harmonic, is going to be periodic. But as far as the amplitude of this particular uh, periodic motion is concerned, it is going to die out as a function of time. This is obviously because there happens to be some amount of damping which is present in the system. So irrespective of the fact whether it is over damped, it is critically damped or it is a case of under damped solution, the complementary part of the solution, the complementary part of the solution is always going to die out because there is a damper present in the system, which is going to absorb the energy present in the system itself. So the complementary part of the solution is always going to die out. The complementary solution, which is indicated by XC, dies out due to damping C. But please notice that this is not going to die out if the damping is not present, which means that if the damping is not present, under that case, the first thing to be noticed is that the vibrations, because of the complementary solution, they are not going to die out. That is one thing. The second thing is, under this case, the system basically becomes a undamped system. So it is going to exhibit oscillations, the frequency of which is going to be equal to omega n. It is not going to be omega d, which is the damped frequency of oscillation. But since if the damping is not present, the system is going to exhibit oscillatory motions of frequency given by the natural frequency of the system, obviously given by under root of k by m. And the second thing is that these oscillations are not going to die out simply because the damping itself is not present. Now coming to the second part of this solution, just a moment. Coming to the second part of the solution, which is known as the particular solution indicated by XP. And this is going to be obtained when the external excitation is actually present in the right hand side of the differential equation. 
So let us just assume the form of uh, the particle solution. It is given by capital X multiplied by sine omega t minus phi. So capital X happens to be the amplitude of oscillation of the particle solution. And since there is an external excitation of frequency omega, it is natural to assume that the solution itself is going to have a natural frequency. It is going to have a frequency omega. There is no natural frequency over here. Since the external excitation itself has a frequency omega, the particular solution itself is going to be composed of, it is going to be of the same frequency omega. And the other thing is that there happens to be a damping present. It is also natural to expect that the response of the system are going to be at some particular phase lag. So that particular phase lag has been included in this solution. And since it is lagging, there happens to be a negative sign before uh, the phase lag phi. So the thing is that we have assumed this particular form of the solution. And if uh, during our mathematical uh, derivation, something odd appears, then obviously it can be assumed that the solution itself, which we have assumed at the starting is wrong. Otherwise, if, if the entire math mathematical derivation is going to, is going to be of some um, correct conclusions, is going to arrive a con correct conclusion, then obviously it means that there is nothing wrong with our assumption, the starting assumption. So this is the displacement which we have uh, assumed. If you differentiate it with respect to time, you get the velocity term. And of course, this particular sign converts in itself into a cos term. And uh, the first thing to be done over here is that we should convert this thing into a equivalent sign term. This is because the displacement itself has a sign term. Okay, this is because the displacement itself has a sign term. So we are converting the cos term in the velocity to an equivalent sign, which can be done with respect to uh, writing as sine 90 minus omega t minus phi. Omega t, the entire angle omega t minus phi is uh, in brackets. And uh, the thing to be noticed here is that once you open the brackets, okay, once you open these brackets, omega is going to be accompanied with a negative sign, which basically is going to mean that the direction of rotation of the velocity vector has changed. Please notice that the displacement vector was counterclockwise because omega was positive. So it was a counterclockwise. This is how you assume angles. This is how you measure angles. Okay. So angles which are clockwise, they are positive. So this angle over here becomes a negative sign or is a positive angle. So it is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. But once it is accompanied with a negative sign, it means that the direction of rotation becomes opposite, which is not desirable. Therefore, this form of uh, the conversion is not taking, is not, uh, uh, is not accepted. We basically write the cos term in the second form. And here you can see that the omega is accompanied with a positive symbol. Therefore, the direction of rotation of this vector, that is the velocity vector over here, this entire thing represents a velocity vector. It is in the anti-clockwise direction. Of course, there is a phase lag, which is indicated by this particular 90 over here. Okay, this is the phase lag, which is between the displacement vector and the velocity vector. So which means that whensoever you displace, whensoever you uh, carry out 
the differentiation of a vector, the resultant vector which you are going to get is always going to be at an angle of 90 degree ahead of the initial vector. This is one, one uh, conclusion which you can draw right over here. But anyhow, now we have a velocity vector. It has the same sign and it has the same anti-clockwise direction of motion. And similarly, you can differentiate this thing once again to get the acceleration vector, which again is going to be accompanied with respect to your sign. And there is a angle of 180 degree, which is going to be involved. This 180 degree is with respect to the displacement vector. Okay. And uh, obviously you can carry out some simple um, calculations, which is going to indicate that the direction of the acceleration vector given by xp double dot is negative to the direction of the displacement vector. Okay, it is opposite to the direction of the displacement vector. Or a term omega t is missing over here. Okay, it is opposite to the direction of the displacement vector and it is proportional to the displacement also. And this is what a simple harmonic motion is. Okay. In simple harmonic motion, you always assume that the uh, there is a retarding force which is acting in a direction opposite to the direction of displacement and it is proportional to displacement also. So here you can see that the acceleration vector which has been derived is in fact opposite to the direction of displacement vector xp and because there is an additional term omega square present over here, it is proportional to the uh, displacement vector. So this is why the uh, most of the, uh, or let, let me say every time you are dealing with simple harmonic motions, you take them only in two forms. Either you take it to be cause or you take to be sign. So these are the only two terms, uh, trigonometric terms of course, which are being used for representing the simple harmonic motion. And this is the reason behind that. Anyhow, so apart from using the same techniques which we have been using in the previous uh, uh, classes, elementary classes of mathematics, we will be solving uh, the governing equation using the vector approach. So part of the vector approach to be used is explained in this figure over here. We have a displacement vector indicated by x. x happens to be the uh, amplitude of the displacement vector. And it has been placed at an angle of omega t minus phi. And since it was seen that the velocity vector is 90 degree ahead of the displacement vector, okay, the, uh, this entire term is the velocity vector. It is 90 degrees ahead of the displacement vector. And it has a magnitude of x omega. Therefore, in the vector diagram, the velocity vector having a magnitude of x omega has been indicated at a direction 90, de 90 degrees ahead of the displacement vector. And similarly, as far as the inertia vector is concerned, x omega square happens to be the amplitude of the inertia vector. And it is one at 180 degrees ahead of the displacement vector or 90 degrees ahead of the velocity vector. So these are the three vectors which have been drawn in space. And obviously, uh, since uh, the vectors are rotating, okay, the vectors are rotating with the angular frequency of omega radians per second, 
all these three vectors are going to rotate in an anti-clockwise direction all together. All three of them are going to rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. But of course, since all of them are rotating all together, the uh, angles between them, that is the angle of 90 degree between the displacement and the velocity vector, and the angle of 90 degree between the velocity vector and the acceleration vector, they are going to remain unchanged. So this is a vector plot for the displacement, velocity, and the acceleration vectors. And in the next slide, we are going to superimpose them uh, on the force vector, which happens to be the vector of external excitation. For that, let me just bring another slide on display. Just a moment. Okay. So before, uh, let me just explain this figure once again. We have an initial force given by F, which is oriented at an angle of omega t. This is the positive x axis. This is the positive x axis. Uh, let me indicate it as kept. Uh, no, okay. Let me just say that this is the horizontal axis. Okay, then. So this happens to be the force vector. It is oriented at an angle of omega t with respect to the horizontal axis. And since it was assumed in the initial uh, uh, lectures that the displacement vector is going to lag an uh, angle of phi with respect to the force vector, therefore the angle x has been drawn, uh, vector x, which represents the, dis the displacement vector, has been drawn at an angle behind the angle of phi behind the force vector. And then Coming to the velocity vector, velocity vector happens to be 90 degrees ahead of the displacement vector. So this is a 90 degree over here. Of course, the amplitude happens to be x omega. And then the acceleration vector is 90 degree further ahead of the velocity vector. So this is the velocity vector which has been drawn. Of course, the amplitude of the uh, no, this is the uh, acceleration vector. Of course, the amplitude of the acceleration vector happens to be m omega square into x. Okay, then. So, this is the relative directions of the vectors. And then we are supposed to satisfy the equation also. Okay, we are supposed to satisfy the governing equation also. Something such as mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to f. And uh, the thing is that if all these polygons, okay, all the polygons which have been drawn over here, if they, all the vectors which have been drawn over here, again, not all the polygons, if the vectors which have been drawn over here, they are going to close a vector, uh, close a polygon, then we can assume that the vectors are balancing each other, okay? We have, for the time being, we have just assumed the directions of the vectors. And of course, if all these vectors are going to form a closed polygon, then they are going to balance out each other. So let me just bring another figure on display. So this is how it is. I had the same force vector. I have the same displacement vector. Okay. You can compare the previous graph and the back and the next graph, the direction of the force vector and the displacement vector they are still the same thing. Okay. Now coming to the spring force. The spring force which is given by k into x, 
but the thing is that if the spring is getting elongated, the direction of the spring, the spring force is going to be in the opposite direction. Okay, it is going to compress the spring. And if the spring is getting compressed, the spring force which is being generated is going to be in the direction opposite to the compression. So if this x over here represents the uh, direction of uh, spring extension, that is x, the direction of spring force is going to be parallel to it, but it is going to be in the opposite direction. So therefore, the spring force has been drawn in a direction opposite to the direction of the vector x. Similarly, x omega happens to be the velocity vector and the damping force which is going to be produced is it going to be in a direction opposite to the damping vector or velocity vector. Therefore, it is in the downward direction. And similarly, the inertia force from left to right. Now, the thing is, that if these four forces, that is the external force F, a spring force given by K into X, damping force given by C X omega, and the inertia force given by M X omega square, if they are supposed to form a closed polygon, this is how it is going to appear. Okay, this is how it is going to appear. And from this particular uh, polygon, it is a quadrilateral in fact. From this polygon, you can find the value of the displacement x. You can simply use the triangle given by B, C, and D. Because this triangle is going to be a right angle triangle, we can use this triangle to find the value of displacement. In fact, the same, same triangle can be used to find the value of the uh, phase also. Since this angle happens to be phase, it means that the angle over here, this is also going to be equal to the phase lag, which is simply going to be BD divided by DC. BD happens to be CX omega, okay, BD happens to be CX omega, and the length DC simply happens to be KX minus the inertia term. So I have this particular equation at my disposal, from which obviously some terms are going to cancel out. So I am cancelled out the X term over here, giving me the final expression of uh, 10 phi is equal to c omega divided by k minus m omega square. So this is the phase lag of the displacement vector with respect to the external excitation. And if I use the same triangle, I can use the Pythagoras theorem to find the value of displacement x, which has been done as this thing. So which means that my polygon, with the help of the polygon, I, am, I have located, I have calculated the magnitude of the displacement vector also. And I have also calculated the phase lag of the displacement vector with respect to the excitation force, with respect to the direction of the excitation force. In the next lecture, in the uh, next lecture, we will try to have a closer look at these two equations which we have obtained. Thank you.